Welcome to Book Club. I'm Jeffrey Sachs, university professor at Columbia University, and I am absolutely thrilled to be with Professor Mariana Mazzucato of University College London. Thank you so much for joining, and especially thank you so much for writing this wonderful book. We're going to be discussing Mission Economy. Uh, you keep uh, writing fabulous, fabulous books, uh, and uh, you have uh, fans all over the world. I know we're being joined by listeners uh, and attendees from dozens and dozens of countries in every continent uh, of the world, possibly Antarctica also. Uh, and uh, they know of your leadership, uh, including uh, entrepreneurial state, which uh, put behind us lots of myths about the role of government. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, the value of everything, about how to orient uh, towards the common good. And today, a mission economy, which you subtitle a moonshot guide to change in capitalism. So it's, it's really great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Jeffrey, and your whole team. It's been fabulous also working with you over the years. So this is great to be able to chat more informally. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's fun. And I think the the timing is right uh, for thinking about a moonshot. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, travails worldwide, of course, with COVID, but we're also having a, a, a more far-reaching discussion about the kind of world we want getting out of this mess. Uh, and maybe you can describe, uh, uh, just to open it up, what is a moonshot? Why do you call it a moonshot uh, guide? Great, well, thank you. So in reality, I tend to actually call it a mission-oriented guide, but I couldn't say the word mission in both the kind of title and the subtitle. And I sort of regret it, by the way, it's interesting, eh? because the problem with the word moonshot is unfortunately it makes people think about a big project, you know, like a siloed project out in the desert or somewhere. Whereas, you know, what the moonshot was, the Apollo moon landing and the, you know, the whole program, was something much bigger than that. And I'm trying to get people to think bigger in terms of also all the different you know, goals that we have out there today, the 17 sustainable development goals. And these are challenges, right? So in terms of the moon landing, the challenge was the space race, you know, beat the Russians, Sputnik. That wasn't the moonshot. The moonshot translated the broad challenge. Remember the challenges, and you're the one who reminds us all the time, are the SDGs, transforming it into a concrete goal, you know, getting to the moon and back but also getting as many different sectors involved. And this is where the word moonshot sometimes gets confusing. You know, getting to the moon required innovation in aeronautics, electronics, nutrition, materials, the entire software industry in some ways was an outcome of that. And what I really think we should be doing today, for example, around the climate challenges is turning those into moonshots, like, you know, 100 carbon neutral cities in a particular uh, area but making it, framing it so it gets as many different sectors involved. So it's not just say about renewable energy. And also really that kind of public private side, right? You know, the Apollo program was not just NASA. There was lots of different companies, Honeywell, Motorola, uh, General Electric and so on. But the partnership was very well designed. I mean, I'm sure it could have been better, but NASA cared to design the partnership to be what I would call today symbiotic and not parasitic. So in the mm -hmm. health sector, we have a lot of parasitic partnerships. And that meant they actually you know, looked at things like, how should we change our current procurement strategy to be more about catalyzing bought-up innovation, but towards a goal, right? So they changed it from cost plus contracts, which also made the cost go up really like too much, to fixed price contracts in terms of their relationship with the uh, companies they were you know, procuring in but with constant incentives for innovation and investment, right? That's why all these spillovers occurred. So, so that, we're so, gonna talk yeah. about uh, all of these design features, which you yeah. feature in the middle part of the book. Yeah. And the book is fantastic because it really is a guide that is useful for all places in the world. And for the listeners, I just wanna emphasize this idea of government, which you know sometimes and often has been given a bad name uh, in, uh, in, in rhetoric. Uh, the idea that, uh, that Mariana is propounding and that I fully concur with uh, is that government can provide a tremendous amount of leadership if it's dynamic and active. And I, I want us to uh, talk about the 
NASA and the moonshot specifically. And uh, just to tell you, I was there. Uh, I was seven years old uh, when uh, the moonshot was announced. So I was there as, as a kid who loved uh, the moonshot. <laughs> so I, I listened to or watched uh, uh, every one of uh, the Mercury, Gemini, and uh, Apollo missions. And to get us in the mood, Mariana, if you'll permit me, I wanted to share my screen if, uh, if the technology will work and, and listen to John F. Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy in 1961, saying to the Congress, let's do something big really a galvanizing moment. And you and I love that kind of approach. <laughs> and it's uh, fun, I think, for people to, uh, to uh, hear it. So if I can yeah. now find- it Because it's hard, not because it's easy. Since early in my term, our efforts in space have been under review. With the advice of the vice president, who is chairman of the National Space Council, we have examined where we are strong and where we are not where we may succeed and where we may not. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe we possess all the resources and talents necessary but the facts of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. We have never specified long-range goals on an urgent time schedule or managed our resources and our time so as to ensure their fulfillment. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. In conclusion, let me emphasize one point. It is not a pleasure for any president of the United States, as I'm sure it was not a pleasure for my predecessors, to come before the Congress and ask for new appropriations which place burdens on our people. I came uh, with, uh, to this conclusion uh, with some reluctance. But in my judgment, this is a most serious time in the life of our country and in the life of freedom around the globe and it is the obligation, I believe, of the President of the United States to at least make his recommendations to the members of the Congress so that they can reach their own conclusions uh, with that uh, judgment before them. You must decide yourselves as I have decided. And I am confident that whether you finally decide uh, in the way that I have decided or not, that your judgment as my judgment is reached on what is in the best interest of our country. Uh this is, was President Kennedy uh, speaking on uh, May 25th, 1961 to the US Congress, when he said that I believe that this country should ag adopt the goal before this decade is out of sending a man to the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And then Mariana, what I love about the speech and uh, hope that people can uh, tune in and listen to is that he said nothing will be so hard or more expensive. Yeah. So almost the opposite of the typical politician. He yeah. didn't say to the American people, this is a breeze, it's, it, it's, uh, we've got it nailed. He said, this is hard. And not that it's gonna be cheap, but it's gonna be expensive. And then he told them, he said to the Congress, don't do this lightly, you know, do this because we're gonna succeed. And if you don't want to carry it through, don't, uh, don't, don't adopt this idea. At which point the whole Congress stands up and cheers and America is on its way to the moon. So why don't you take it from there? Because you describe beautifully uh, the next uh, phase. Sure. Well, thanks for that. And I think it is important, you know, don't worry that it didn't come on. This will force everyone to go listen to it after this. It'll make it even more resonating. 
so the speech I actually um, kind of you know go through in the book is also the other speech at Rice Stadium where he you know does exactly what you just said and says we're going to do it because it's hard not because it's easy and even just stopping there for a moment and think of all the language like literally the storytelling and the narrative we've convinced ourselves of the role of policy you know it's all about fixing problems you know you fix market failures at best it's about enabling or de-risking the cool risk takers which are somewhere else today they're in places like silicon valley and the word facilitating that's become a word i'm sort of allergic to right i mean the the word i'm italian facile you know from latin easy you're not trying to make things easier for other people you're confronting the difficulty right climate change is hard <laughs> inequality today is hard to tackle we do it because it's hard, but it's important. We need you know, missions precisely to confront the challenges that we have. And I think what's also so interesting, and I don't think people realize, but in both 1961 and still in 1962, these guys had no clue how to get to the moon, right? So the level of innovation, experimentation, trial and error and error and error, and the errors often you know, led to death was enormous. And the fact that they were willing to experiment and make mistakes it's just, again, so different today, where as soon as a civil servant makes a mistake, they're in the you know, front page of the Daily Mail or the equivalent to newspaper in everyone's country there. And you know, experimentation is key if you're a value creator. It's not key if you're just pushing papers around or at best kind of redistributing the value that's created somewhere else. So the idea that actually wealth creation itself is collective enterprise and all the different actors in both the public and the private sector need to be investing within their own organizations in the ability to create value. Interestingly, was actually sorry. Interestingly, was actually something that NASA was very aware of. So the head of procurement, this guy Ernest Brackett, he had this really interesting concept. He said, if we stop investing in our own kind of brain, our own research and development, then when we're interacting with private sector organizations, which they had to, this really was a public-private partnership, we won't even know how to write the terms of reference. So he said in order to prevent what he called brochuremanship, which is a word I love, you know, at the time they didn't have PowerPoint presentations from PwC and Deloitte, they had brochures from companies that would come in and sell themselves. He said, in order to prevent us getting captured by brochuremanship, we ourselves need to remain capable, dynamic and invest within our brain. And secondly, you know, after the Apollo 1 fire, which was, you know, tragic incident, three uh, uh, astronauts died, um, they went through a whole kind of inward, um, you know, digression where they said, maybe we don't have the right organization because Gus Grissom, one of the three astronauts who died on January 27th, 1967, before the fire, he said, Jesus Christ, you know, how are we ever going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? That's because he couldn't hear what was being said for mission control room. And that was part of the problem. Um, there was many problems on that day, but anyway, that kind of lack of horizontal communication, each department kind of working in silos, we know is a common feature of governments, right? It's probably also a common feature of large private sector organizations. But the fact that if you are a purpose-oriented, mission-oriented, big, you know, goal-oriented public organization, you also, you know, it's, it's, it's not just about spending money, you also have to have an inward change in your culture, more horizontal communication, you need to be more agile, flexible, this is a huge lesson today for public institutions. Otherwise, I was just on a call today with um, an interview for an Italian paper and the usual kind of pushback you get is, oh my God, come on, but do you see what kind of state we have? So instead of just kind of stopping with the snapshot of the current types of bureaucracies we have and they're problematic bureaucracies, some bureaucracies can be dynamic and creative, right? So it's not the bureaucracy itself that's the problem, it's the kind. Instead of just bashing government for being slow, inertial, lots of red tape, what does it actually mean to transform that? And I think the first step has to be, and I'll shut up in a minute, to start with the idea of what is the state even for? You know, to go beyond this idea that you're just there to fix markets and to really develop both the framing, but an intra kind of organizational toolkit for what it means to co-create and shape markets, not just fix them towards directions that we need, you know, inclusive, sustainable growth and so on. I think one of the amazing things, which as you mentioned it, is that when President Kennedy gave the speech, in May 1961, the US had had one flight in space, a suborbital flight for 15 minutes, uh, Alan Shepard. Uh, they had uh, no clear way to achieve what the president was about to announce. He didn't uh, have uh, at the time, or he didn't listen to 
uh, a, a gaggle of advisors, oh, you can't say that. How do you know? And, and by the end of the, the decade, and isn't that a little bit rash? And what are they going to ask us? But he went ahead and, and declared the absolutely bold uh, bold vision and bold goal and a time-bound goal also. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's, it's stunning to think about uh, when the first flights were taken, uh, there weren't, of, of course, even uh, electronic boards to monitor the flight. There was literally uh, a model uh, rocket on plastic on a uh, on a wire that they were pushing with the stick wow. <laughs> physically <laughs> in the first shot of yeah. to know where Alan Shepard was in, in this uh, fifteen-minute yeah. flight. They were using teletype. And as has been often said, we have more computing power in, in our smartphones than NASA had available on site at Cape Canaveral for years. So yeah. the drama of this is phenomenal. The fact uh, that I think it's estimated that 20,000 companies got together, 500,000 people, truly private sector, but led by yeah. NASA. By a goal. You yeah. know, it's, it's stunning. So. How could it be, and I think it is one of the, the puzzles uh, that, and you've uh, written a lot about this and thought a lot about this. The US government uh, had, you know, for all its consequences, developed uh, the atomic bomb uh, in the Manhattan Project, uh, one of the most phenomenal uh, enterprises of applied science in history, uh, absolutely incredible. It had gone to the moon. And then yet, despite that, a few years later, Ronald Reagan was saying, uh, you can't trust the government to do anything. It's incompetent, the idea that government can't manage, can't lead. How could we fall into that mode of thinking with this amazing uh, history of accomplishment before our eyes? Uh, this is, uh, to me, a, a massive social and intellectual puzzle. You took that on already uh, in the entrepreneurial state, and now you're talking about how to make missions. But where did that mythology come from? Uh, it's uh, an opening part of this book also when you talk about bad theory, bad practice. <laughs> how could you get the idea that government is incompetent when it had just gone to the moon within yeah. the timeline, no less, that President Kennedy had set out because let's remember Neil Armstrong walked on the moon yeah. in July 1969 before the decade was through in eight years. So yeah. where did the bad idea come from? Interesting. So, I mean, first of all, it, like we should just say, and I'm sure we'll come back to it later, but let's just bookmark it now, that the kind of modern problems that you and I care about from climate change to, you know, getting the plastic out of the ocean to, you know, really in, in, in a moonshot approach, also fight different types of inequalities. That's actually harder than getting to the moon, right? Because these are so-called wicked problems that also require political, regulatory, behavioral change, and so on. But getting to the moon was, of course, very hard. Again, they had no clue. They had these different ways that they initially thought they might get there. There's the direct approach, the Earth orbit rendezvous, and they finally settled on the lunar orbit rendezvous. And what I was talking about before was the need to actually experiment, right? Trial and error and error. And then learning from those errors requires actually investing within your capacity to learn. And here's where your point becomes really central. Because if at the same time, there is sort of an ideological warfare about reducing, not so much even just the size of the state, that as well, but the remit of what the state is for. And especially by the way, around the welfare state areas a bit less on innovation state areas. And I say that specifically because Ronald Reagan never reduced the budget really of some of the key organizations I look at in the entrepreneurial state, including the National Institutes of Health, the SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Program, DARPA. What he and also Thatcher reduced was really the kind of um, welfare state arm. So, you know, public remember health, the, public education as Ray, well. Ray. Yeah, Reagan, Reagan also, and it was a, a deliberate attack, very relevant for today, he attacked uh, alternative energy. 
Uh, that, exactly. I was just he, about to say that, actually. He Trump took the was, solar yeah. panels off yeah, of uh, the roof that Jimmy Carter had put on. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And by the way, Trump, who I think is less, you know, um, mad than some people think he is, he's, he was very strategic. The first thing he did when he became president was actually attack some of the most ambitious public organizations in terms of their remit, literally like public broadcasting and ARPA-E. ARPA-E was his first target. I mean, people- Explain what ARPA-E is. People, people don't know what ARPA-E so is. DARPA is the Advanced Research Projects Agency within the Department of Defense, which came up with the internet, right? Everything in our smartphones that make them smart and not stupid, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, were actually outcomes of public investments in organizations like DARPA. Um, and ARPA-E was an organization that under Obama, after the financial crisis, he set up because you'll remember there was an 800 billion stimulus program and very early on he tried, this is before the whole Tea Party thing happened, to actually direct the stimulus in a green direction. He brought in a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, to direct the Department of Energy and they set up ARPA-E, so the equivalent of DARPA, but around energy and kind of green transition, sustainable growth kind of strategies. And, and ARPA-E, by the way, has a tiny budget. It's about 300 million compared to 3 billion of DARPA. But again, forget the money for a minute, you know, this is an ambitious organization, which is trying to, again, experiment around a portfolio of different types of investments that'll be you know, really important for innovation uh, around sustainable growth. They've been important for battery storage, for example, and going after ARPA-E is, is critical for, you know, a, an ideological war kind of against an ambitious state because budgets come and go. We shouldn't forget that. Budgets, you can cut it one trimester or one year and it can come back the other year. If you actually go after the organizational kind of DNA of the state, say the BBC, which is under attack in the UK, it can take half a century <laughs> for these organizations to come back, right? Anyway, so your question was about kind of the ideology. And I think, you know, I always, again, begin with what is even the market? Like, what do we even mean by capitalism? And we shouldn't confuse markets with business. Markets are outcomes of how we organize all the different organizations that create value, public organizations, private organizations, others increasingly important in the say nonprofit area, you know, the, the Gates Foundation or the Wellcome Trust, but how we govern these organizations and how they relate one to another determine the kind of outcomes we get. So if you have an overly financialized business sector, you know, $4 trillion have been used just to buy back shares in the last 10 years by S&P 500 companies. If you have government institutions that at best, you know, at worst are scared to do anything at best, are there to fix market failure. So they actually have to wait for things to screw up before they come in. That's gonna give you a particular type of economy. And if those relationships are say parasitic, right? You know, you actually have say, uh, like we have in the health sector where you have 40 billion, you know, spent by the US government on health innovation, the private sector comes in, which it should, and you know, can use that innovation, especially the high risk early stage government funding. Um, so the Pfizer's of the world come in, tend to come in a bit later. And if we don't govern the patents in such a way that actually make sure that you know, the innovations are accessible and that after the patents are up, there's more diffusion. If the prices of the drugs don't actually reflect that public contribution and so on, then that public investment isn't actually getting like its proper return. And I'm not thinking just monetarily. So the more you take away the confidence of the state and talk about its remit at best as fixing a problem and then get the hell out of the way, or facilitating, enabling, being a lender of last resort instead of an investor of first resort, that affects both the kind of capabilities you think you need within government, but also the confidence, and this is important, the confidence and the kind of security that you're gonna actually also strike a good deal for who, for citizens, right? Because I'm talking especially about democratically elected uh, governments. I, I think, think uh, you, ideology... touched, you touched on something uh, very uh, immediately relevant uh, day uh, by day right now that I think is uh, worth mentioning for everybody listening. Uh, we are, uh, of course, in the race to immunize people all over the world uh, against uh, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. And the uh, lead vaccines, uh, two of them, uh, at least the one made by uh, BioNTech and Pfizer and the one made by Moderna are these new vaccine uh, types uh, called mRNA vaccines. And these companies are, uh, of course, uh, producing them and making uh, 
billions of dollars of market capitalization and uh, massive profits on the basis of them. And they are saying, you see the power of the private sector. But I think the point that you mentioned quickly, and I want to underscore, yep. is where did those mRNA vaccine platforms come from? They did not come from uh, BioNTech, even less Pfizer, because BioNTech was the science uh, part of that joint venture. They did not come from Moderna, the two companies that are producing uh, these uh, mRNA vaccines. They came actually from academic scientists at University of Pennsylvania, funded by the US government, funded yeah. by the National Institutes of Health, funded by the agency, the, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease, NIAID, led by Tony Fauci, uh, our lead uh, infectious disease scientist of the United States. And it was many, many years of government funding that made this possible. Uh, yeah. And indeed, it's only in the end stage that the two companies came in and with the financing of the NIH carried through the phase one, two, and three clinical trials to get this into operation. So just to underscore your point in the most immediate context, these vaccines are produced by government scientific leadership uh, yeah. and support of a scientific community, not a business community. We need the business community. It, it does important things. But the idea that people have that, oh, it's business against the heavy bureaucracy of government is really a messed up idea. But you could break down that point, you know, because the amount of public funding is, again, a point that I keep kind of, you know, trying to reveal. And specifically with the vaccines, the six vaccines, it's over $12 billion that governments have put in. But then, you know, the other point is once we've admitted that there's both, you know, lots of public money, that high risk, early stage, capital intensive phase. So the, you know, that's why I called it the entrepreneurial state, because it's the high risk stuff that tends to be what government does. What does it mean to actually then govern it? in the public interest. And what's really interesting, and I didn't realize this until I um, started to look into it, when the Defense Department funds health, because they do, because soldiers die on the battlefield, obviously not just by uh, gunshot wounds, but also through sickness of different types, when they fund health innovation, they're not naive. <laughs> they make sure that you know the medicines, the therapies, and so on, whatever it may be, and antibiotic, and you know the different types of um, health innovations actually get to the battlefield. That the soldiers, that you know the Defense Department paid the the, the health innovation for, um, actually get it. Whereas we don't have that with NIH. Actually, you know NIH has what's called marching rights. In other words, when you have publicly funded. Uh, uh, medicines, the prices should reflect that. So they should be able, for example, to cap the price of a medicine and not just let it go to whatever the market will bear, which is basically what value-based pricing allows. Um, and yet they don't see that as their role. I mean, I, I, I gave a, a keynote lecture at the NIH a couple of years ago and I asked them and they said, yeah, well, you know, that's not our thing. Yeah, we might agree with you, but that's not our kind of remit. And I kind of hope that this idea of building back better and the fact that so much money is now going into the system, you know, as it often does kind of last minute, often it's too late. <laughs> we need to have a more continual way to think about things like outcomes based budgeting. But when we're just kind of pouring money in, as we are now two trillion with the build back better, you know, a, a policy, the American recovery plan, but also another four, sorry, trillion, uh, two trillion, another four trillion for the infrastructure plan, what does it mean to govern it to make sure that it actually reaches people, that we have stronger institutions, that we have better partnerships. That means much more than just flooding the system with liquidity or with public investment. And of course we need public investment. We have you know, decaying infrastructure, but the kind of investment and the details of the partnership matter. And that's really what the book's about. It kind of unpicks what does it mean to construct a mutualistic partnership? What does it mean to pay attention to the nitty gritty stuff, you know, grants, loans, bailouts, procurement strategies to design them as ambitiously as NASA did to really foster that bottom-up innovation, but again, targeted, and to also share the rewards. And on that, it's really interesting. NASA had this no excess profits clause in the procurement contracts, which if you think of what's happening in space today, which is the kind of the new gambling <laughs> casino, 
um, you know, that would be quite useful because it's not about saying no profits. You know, they don't want the business sector to come in through charity, you know, corporate social responsibility. No, produce stuff, work together, fine. But how we share in the rewards needs to be determined in terms of how we even talk about who's doing what. So NASA being confident that it obviously had a very directional role and was making its own investments, then it took care to have that no excess profits clause. Whereas today, coming back to my earlier point that even in countries where you have the public investment, when the confidence isn't there, you get a bad deal. And the green deal, we should you know, not forget the deal part. The green bit, you know, as Greta says, listen to the scientists, <laughs> but the deal bit, that's really a new social compact. And I think we need as much innovation on you know, a better deal, a better social compact, you know, proper stakeholder value driven capitalism, as opposed to shareholder maximization. That stuff, you know, hopefully is what people will remember when they read the book. I, I, I think the uh, notion that uh, setting the terms of the deal right is so crucial. Uh, staying with the vaccine issue is not only how things are priced, but as you said, what is made available to whom? Because yeah. now we need worldwide immunization. The, the companies are saying, well, we don't want to share the intellectual property, that's ours. That's how the market yeah. economy works. But it's a little naive, uh, yeah. not, not naive. It, a choice. It, Why is that a choice? They should be, you know, like this whole idea of conditionalities, all that government funding that you and I just talked about should come with strings attached. You shouldn't be allowed to kind of abuse patents. Patents are often too wide, they're too strong, hard to license, they're too upstream. So what the World Health Organization has been calling for is a patent pool to foster kind of that collective intelligence that currently we need, not just for the vaccine rollout, which is you know, also incredibly important in terms of solidarity and not having vaccine apartheid, which Dr. Tedros talks about in terms of the hoarding of the doses just in rich countries, but the knowledge creation mechanisms themselves, how do you govern knowledge creation in, in order to really foster as much collective intelligence and the patents are often used to extract value which is not really what they were there for. They were meant to incentivize innovation, but you can govern them in such a way that you know, uh, does get the objectives we want. Maybe but you could say like, one word about uh, what, what uh, it means, as you said, to have margin rights and, and what the government could do even in the immediate context. Yeah, I mean, margin rights specifically, I mean, this is really interesting because you'll remember that, um, what was it, 1982, there was the Bay Dole Act which allowed something to happen, which until then didn't happen, which is that publicly funded science before then, the idea was it was just stay in the kind of open domain, right? That you couldn't like patent it if it was coming out of, a, you know, especially publicly funded uh, science. So they wanted then to, the idea was that that was kind of uh, impeding commercialization of science and that was bad. And so the Beidol Act actually allowed publicly funded science to result in patents and many different companies actually were set up because of that. So the whole biotech revolution that we call the biotech revolution from basically that period's on, it wasn't actually that you know, more knowledge was, was being created. It was that more companies could actually start up literally from the patents that all of a sudden could be, were being allowed. Now, as part of that process, there was a recognition that we would have to then be careful, right? This isn't actually about privatizing completely publicly funded science. It meant to, at least initially, the idea was let's just make sure it leads to more commercialization but the deal was in their head. So if you read the Beidol Act, it actually has within it, it's a long act, that obviously publicly funded you know, uh, medicines, the price should reflect that. So the NIH, for example, but it's not just the NIH, you also have the Veterans Administration, you have BARDA, bits of DARPA that do health innovation, should be able to control the prices or the prices should reflect at least the fact that there was that public contribution. So it's basically like a market cap on the prices of medicines that have a strong public funding base. You, you and that's I have never both, been, that's yeah. never been used. So you, you, you and know. I have both complained about uh, a case, yes. uh, another case uh, uh, of, against hepatitis C exactly. yeah, yeah. Uh, of, of Gilead, uh, yeah. which, which I've written Mad. a lot about uh, also, yeah. Uh, yeah. where the company ended up charging yeah. 1000 times the yeah. unit cost of, of the pill for something that it yeah. didn't develop, it actually bought the technology. Yeah. And if you trace it back and back and back, this was NIH supported yeah. work by NIH. But that's also true for scientists. remdesivir. That's true for remdesivir now. An another, yes, that's a COVID-19 yeah. uh, uh, therapeutic. Yeah, so-, but, so but the margin uh, right- This shows uh, the, the point that you're making that uh, yeah. 
the deal has to be thought through skillfully. And maybe, Mariana, that uh, is a good segue to the section of, uh, of the book of Mission Economy on good theory, good practice, because you list a number of highlights of what does it mean to have good practice. You have uh, listeners uh, today from, uh, as I say, uh, 60 or more countries, uh, I believe it is. Each one of them is going to be advising their governments or maybe in government or listening to their government. What are the good theory, good practices that you want them to know? Of course, they need to read the book. <laughs> this uh, <laughs> wonderful guidebook. But uh, what are the, uh, the main good practices that are crucial for getting a good deal of an entrepreneurial state? Thank you for allowing me to answer that question because it's so important now as it was also before and especially in the future if we finally get serious about the SDGs. Uh, just really quickly, March and Rights, the point is they're never used. It's there yep. in the law and we haven't used it. So let alone the things we do need, and this comes to your question, which we don't have and, and what we should be kind of fighting for in terms of better policy. But even when we have good laws, we don't use them when they're going against an ideology. And so really kind of uncovering the faulty assumptions behind the ideology is, is what I look at both in terms of bad theory, bad practice, and then good theory, good practice. So I broke down the, the good theory bit into seven areas. One is about value, you know, actually having an economic kind of approach and framing that explicitly recognizes that value is collectively created. You know, even those people that talk about stakeholder value in the same breath about stakeholder value instead of shareholder value will still say business creates value and then should be sharing that value amongst different stakeholders. And I always kind of stop them and say, no, stakeholder value needs to, first of all, admit that value is not just created in business. It's also created by public institutions. It's created by workers who need to be invested in instead of you know, extracting so much uh, value out of companies sometimes that then you know, human capital formation and training isn't uh, uh, brought forward. The second bit is markets. You know, so new approach to value is collectively created. The second is markets, really understanding that markets are outcomes of how we you know, govern the different uh, collective actors, but especially how they relate to one another, means also that the kind of policy we need is not about fixing markets, but really actively shaping and co-creating markets to get us the objectives we want, right? So if we want inclusive growth, sustainable growth, and within that actually tackle really important missions, it can't be done just by kind of leveling the playing, uh, playing field and fixing markets, we need to tilt markets in a particular direction and actively shape and create them. But that's not about picking winners, you know, one technology, one sector, one firm. It is about choosing a direction and then having a portfolio approach to get there, right? So not putting all our eggs in one basket. And that comes, you know, back to that point about solar, wind, different types of renewable energy, but you need to at least first make the choice to move somewhere. The third bit is about organizational capacity. It's too easy to keep bashing the state for being inertial, boring, you know, just you know, a bunch of rules. Well, if that's what we think the state is for, just for picking up the mess, that's the kind of state we're gonna get. One that hasn't actually thought about its intra-organizational governance, culture, risk-taking, portfolio approach, um, you know, again, dynamic procurement instead of just handouts and so on. So that kind of you know, inward look at the kind of organizational capacity we need within the public sector means we need actually even just a theory of dynamic capabilities within public institutions, as ambitious as those that we have in the private sector, where you have MBA classes, you know, talking about strategic management, organizational science, decision sciences, organizational behavior, and so on. We don't have that in MPAs, masters in public administrations. So that's why, by the way, I've set up a whole institute at UCL, which is really driven by this idea of kind of rethinking the state from within the civil service and actually, you know, getting dynamic bureaucracies and not um, inertial ones. The, the fourth bit was on finance. You know, we too often hear, oh, we need more finance for this, finance for that, finance for renewable energy. Actually, there's plenty of finance out there. We just have the wrong finance. It's often inpatient, exit-driven finance, even venture capital, which is, you know, the kind of, you know, finance that's supposed to help us with startups and innovation. The fact it is exit-driven and wants to exit through an IPO or a buyout in three or four years has, in some cases, like biotech, rushed uh, the process, and we've ended up with lots of um, what Bill Ozonic and I have called PLEPOs, productless IPOs. So patient long-term strategic finance is what we need, but also outcomes-based budgeting and outcomes-based finance. Instead of saying, 
here's a pot of money, see what you can do with it. We need to start with what's the problem and kind of work backwards on what it means for finance, for deficits, for procurement, for pu public private partnerships. Thank you. Can so, I just underscore yeah. that? Uh, it's yeah. a point I've been also trying to make for 30 years, <laughs> which is Good. when you, when you have goals, you budget for the goals. Yeah. Uh, you don't say, I have a goal to have every child in school. Now I'll raise the uh, education budget 5%. You say, if every child is going to be in school, what do we need exactly. for that? Uh, if we're going to get everybody immunized against COVID-19, what do we need for that? Uh, if we're going to ensure universal access to digital and poor people can't pay, what do we need for that? So mission-based budgeting starts with the mission and then sets the budget. It doesn't start with the budget. And then, as you said, see what you can do. Uh, exactly. And I think it's just and hope an for the best. <laughs> and hope for the best. And uh, don't be surprised. Do <laughs> don't be surprised uh, when you fall short. Uh, yeah. If you want to go to the moon, you better budget to go to the moon. That's why President Kennedy said uh, nothing will be more expensive. But he said, don't do this if you're yeah. going to stop halfway. That's not our goal. So yeah. uh, this, I think, is a very important point that I want to underscore. But Absolutely. please continue. So three more. Sorry, yes. uh, this is very pedantic of me to go through all seven. I could have just done one of Im them. And important them. that you do. Yeah. <laughs> so the fifth one is about distribution. You know, absolutely all. I mean, hopefully most of the people in your audience believe in, you know, progressive, not regressive uh, distribution in terms of how we design our tax systems. But that's not enough. We need to actually create wealth differently as opposed to focusing too much just on redistribution to achieve inclusive growth. So this idea of kind of pre-distribution to actually get the conditions right in the first place, to make sure, as we were saying before, that we're not just sharing risks, but also rewards, requires you know, a distribution and pre-distribution lens to how we create value. And that's one of the concepts I bring forward. The idea of partnership, you know, purpose-driven partnership, that's the sixth principle in that last chapter. And I think that's important because there's lots of talk, and it's good talk, within the corporate community of putting purpose at the center of the corporation, of again, going for stakeholder, not shareholder value, but that's always gonna be limited unless the notion of purpose is at the center of the system of how say public, private and third sector, including trade unions, you know, how they relate one to another. And that's why I kind of go into, I bother going into one of the chapters into how actually these contracts were designed to put purpose at the center of the collaborations. And I do think that requires walking the talk of stakeholder value now with the vaccine, you know, with these ideas about patents and how, you know, cause patents are contracts. Their contracts between public and private. So get that right, you get a lot of other good things flowing. And the last one is on participation. And this is really important, I think, because whereas the moon landing, the Apollo program was, you know, kind of rightly, because it was basically te a, a technology feat, top down, you know, directed by NASA, you know, it was Kennedy and a bunch of other white guys in the room determining things today for the SDGs, especially ones that have to do with sustainability, with inequality, with gender parity, with all the, you know, all 17 goals, the more we can get participatory structures, kind of co-creation and co-design to even decide what the missions are in the first place, the better. And for this, you know, one of the areas that I'm working on, working in the world is a very local part of London that I'm from, or sorry, that I live in, Camden Council. And what's interesting is we have a Camden Renewal Commission where the missions that we've set up are very place-based. So for example, carbon neutral housing, what does it mean to bring citizens who live in the social housing to the table in terms of actually talking about sustainable living and the kind of you know, things that they'd like to see in the places they're living. And that requires a social innovation in areas like citizen assemblies, right? Or if you look at in Spain, there's a particular region where we've done some work um, in Mondragon where they have a whole history of the cooperative movement, right? So there's a huge cooperative called Mondragon with 87,000 workers in the Basque region there. And they have a experience with co-ops and you know, mutual types of organizations. What can we learn from that experience in terms of this kind of you know, co-design process. And lastly, we should remember in terms of participation, labor, right? You know, I, I mentioned before trade unions, trade unions got us some of the best social innovations we've ever seen in capitalism. The weekend, not bad, the eight hour workday, the fact children don't work in factories. And so there's something about bringing labor's voice as well as you know, the students, you know, Fridays for the future and so on to the table in the co-creation phase and not just after the fact 
to defend workers against things like, you know, what's going to happen with employment as some sectors kind of dwindle away. So that's the just transition movement, which is very important. But the concept of the just transition, as important as it is, making sure workers kind of, you know, transition along and don't just get left behind, that's kind of reactive. We need a proactive approach where different voices and labor's voices, what I'm highlighting here, is genuinely at the table to even talk about you know, the future of, of particular uh, parts of our economy. And so oh, that participation bit, I think, needs a lot of thinking. And, and I think it's actually the hardest bit. Could we uh, spend the uh, remaining uh, uh, precious minutes uh, applying uh, these principles? You've started to uh, name many great examples to the European Green Deal, which you are uh, playing a, a major role in uh, helping to uh, get underway. Uh, I think the European Green Deal is extremely uh, important because it is a holistic approach to uh, the range of environmental challenges uh, from climate to land use, biodiversity, and so forth, circular economy, pollution. Uh, so it's very ambitious. It's an important role model, I think, for other parts of the world. Uh, I was delighted when President Biden brought 40 world leaders together. Uh, including a uh, uh, European Union Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, to discuss essentially a worldwide Green Deal approach. W what have you seen so far of the European Green Deal? What do you recommend to the listeners to take from it for applying in the national or regional circumstances where they may be living? So first of all, I think one thing that people might not know is that it's, it's a really historic moment in Europe because the European Recovery Fund called Next Gen EU is extremely different from the recovery fund we saw after the financial crisis where the conditions attach, and these are public public conditions, not public private, the conditions attach for the member states to get access to European Commission money was they had to cut their deficits, right? I mean, that was all the obsession was on that. You know, 3% was, you know, over that everything was, you know, all hell would break loose. And slowly that 3% went to 0% deficits is what, you know, countries were being told to go for. This time, luckily, on the back of realizing that that so-called austerity didn't work and in many countries that led to much worse growth and in fact increased debt to, to GDP ratios because then the state had to come in and pick up the pieces that fall from low growth in terms of unemployment, crime, and so on. This time, the conditions are you have to have a strategy, a strategy on what? Climate and digitalization. So all the 27 member states have had to literally as we speak, they're submitting these plans to the European Commission. And this itself is amazing. You know, Forget the fact that some of these countries might have the wrong plans or they might not be implemented. Just the fact that the conditionality is on investment instead of cutting your public budget, that's a big change. And, and, fact, and important, climate, I think, just to underscore green yeah. and digital. Oh, exactly, uh, so I yeah. just want to say that. Yeah. Absolutely. Climate change targets, and they, and, and they can be of different types. They can be about changing how steel is produced, how cement is produced, but especially city level, regional level policies, you know, carbon neutral cities. This is incredibly important. And the other one was the digital divide issues. There's a separate pot for health. Um, and you know, I had worked for about three years with the commission trying to argue that they had to you know, stop thinking just about random sectors you know, and think about these missions. And the example I actually gave, I don't know if you can see it here, <laughs> was to start with you know, the climate change SDG 13, turn it into a really ambitious objective, 100 carbon neutral cities by 2030, get as many different sectors across Europe involved. So real estate, mobility areas, food, social sectors, construction, you know, and so on and so forth. And then the bottom up projects that would be galvanized by actually changing how European policy was structured, in particular, innovation policy, procurement, and so on, would bring in all sorts of, you know, interesting things like carbon neutral, urban food industries, citizen carbon ID cards, and so on and so forth. Um, but, but then the next step was, how do you make sure that this kind of green mission-oriented approach isn't just about your innovation policy, but is at the center of European growth and kind of that directed growth? Then COVID happened, <laughs> and now we have a recovery scheme. But just the fact that very soon, actually, um, um, uh, the, the commission brought this idea of kind of the green deal outside of a silo of just like the Department of the Environment within the commission, or within member states departments to the center of European growth. This idea that growth has not just a rate, but a direction. 
and European directed growth was going to be around the European Green Deal. That as well was really important because it's not that governments don't talk green. It's just that it often remains a peripheral bit of what they're doing. And so I think with COVID, about uh, everything. with with COVID, uh, the uh, good dynamic in the midst of the crisis was the idea we are going to have to build forward in a better way. Exactly. So it didn't push aside the European Green Deal to say, well, that no longer applies. It actually reinforced the idea that as we uh, end the pandemic, where are we going to be? Are we going to be adrift or are we yeah. going to be heading someplace? And yeah. so I think the fact that the European Green Deal was uh, doubled, they doubled down on the importance of it was really important in, in the COVID pandemic context. Absolutely. And but what's interesting, you know, on the one hand, there's a European plan and there's European recovery and there's European Green Deal. But then what, what I'm observing is very, how do you say, differences, heterogeneity, between how different governments are actually tackling it. And in France, you know, France is not perfect, but one thing they did that I thought was very good is, you know, President Macron during the European recovery said very quickly, we're not here just to bail out business, but to help it transform in a green direction. So there was very strict criteria attached to the bailouts that both Renault got to the car manufacturer and Air France. They had to commit to lowering their carbon emissions in the next five years to get part of the French national recovery. Uh, in the UK, we didn't do that. There was a massive bailout to EasyJet, no conditions attached. In um, Austria and Denmark, one of the conditions was you have to stop using tax havens. And if you wanna keep using them, fine, but guess what? You ain't getting a penny, mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a Euro, right? So this idea again, of kind of a new social compact at the center of both public public, right? So European money given to member states only if they have a climate strategy, but also public private, you only get a subsidy guaranteed loan, bailout recovery if you transform. That can be actually a win-win strategy if we all care about achieving you know, sustainable growth. But that's why that conversation and more particip participatory conversation about what are we even trying to do? <laughs> you know, what does Build Back Better actually mean? What are our goals? That's why it's so essential. It's not just about politically correct talk. It's actually central to how you then organize the economy. One thing that I've seen, and I think it's been extremely powerful, Europe's adoption of the Green Deal really has opened eyes around the world. One very specific reason was that Europe said we're going to put on border taxes so that you can't import into us goods that are made with carbon intensive technologies. In other words, other countries, you're gonna to have to clean up your act. But I think the model of the European Green Deal has had a worldwide galvanizing effect because here was a, a, a group, complicated group, 27 countries, all uh, aligning around goals, aligning around these missions, aligning around a budget to put it into place. And it wasn't soon after uh, that, uh, President Xi Jinping announced at the UN General Assembly, okay, China is going to decarbonize by 2060 latest. And in the Chinese system, when the president said that, it got incorporated uh, into the 14th plan. Suddenly, uh, as I'm sure you noticed, all of our Chinese colleagues are working on uh, strengthening this decarbonization pathway. So it's been very exciting. Then Japan, then Korea, now the United States uh, under President yeah. Biden. So we are seeing, yeah. I think, uh, a truly a wave of the entrepreneurial state uh, taking a shape right now, a new era after what in uh, our countries, <laughs> US, UK, uh, had been uh, the Reagan-Thatcher anti-state philosophy f that yeah. lasted basically for a 40 year period. Yeah. But I think and by the, I, yeah. I really feel we're in a new in a new era. I definitely think so, and I hope it lasts, and we don't get what I'm already starting to hear. It's like, yeah, we're doing it now, but then we got to pay it back, right? And then you get another way of of austerity, which is just blanket and actually undermining the social fabric, which made this particular health pandemic even worse than it had to be. Um, one of the council, sorry, one of you know, you and I are in different councils, but one that I'm extremely proud of that's just beginning is one that Dr. Tedros has asked me to um, set up for the World Health Organization. It's called the UN Council on the Economics of Health for All. And there the logic is, you know, people have talked about health and the economy, but often it was like, invest in health because it's good for the economy. What happens right. when you say health for 
all, right? That's the mission. It's not just health, you know, this blanket thing. Well, health that is a precisely SDG three. Exactly. And then you backtrack and say, what does it mean for the economy? Right? So, you, right. So what does it mean again for budgeting, outcomes-based budgeting, which as you say, you've worked on, what does it mean for the design of procurement? What does it mean for the design of public private partnerships and so on? So again, the economy is there to, you know, uh, fuel solutions for goals. That's just a very different logic. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things about China is that there's a little country, right? China's huge. There's a little country called Denmark. <laughs> well, guess what? Denmark is the number one provider of high tech green digital services to China. And China's spending, I, I almost just said China like Trump did. <laughs> anyway, China's spending uh, uh, over 2 trillion on greening every single sector in its economy. And Denmark is servicing it. And, and if you look at how that occurred, how this like hub of you know, really dynamic startups that have produced these innovative green digital services, often that came from city level policies, you know, actually having a goal for you know, green Copenhagen and that it wasn't just let's get a bunch of startups to just create gadgets, but to fuel solutions for something the country was demanding, right? So that market creation, that itself is something I think we really need to learn about for industrial strategies. So industrial strategies shouldn't be about just kind of random categories of firms like startups are good or random sectors, you know, name your top sectors, but focus on problems, get all your different sectors to innovate towards that. And of course, if you are an SME, you're gonna get extra help, but not because you're an SME, but you're kind of picking the willing along the way and you get and help because you'll, you're part of the solution. And it's a great example, Denmark, for many, many reasons. A, a good one for us to close on because it shows that uh, moving in the green direction wasn't some heavy burden yeah. and heavy cost and uh, eat, eat your spinach uh, homework to do, uh, it, that it was an assignment. It ended up creating a very dynamic export sector, uh, a, uh, another uh, even higher level of prosperity, but in an utterly sustainable way and I'm always uh, delighted that uh, Denmark, with all of its green success and social inclusion success, also comes out uh, number one or number two or number three each year in the World Happiness Report uh, as uh, the among the happiest countries in the world as well. So there's something very good in this mix that we have been talking about. Uh, the hour uh, sped by very fast, Mariana. I'm so grateful, but the, the reason is your energy uh, your clarity, uh, your leadership is so crucial and timely. And I'd like to remind everybody, uh, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism is really an important book for everybody uh, in all parts of the world. We are in a new era of dynamic entrepreneurial government, uh, of the mission of sustainable development, of the 17 sustainable development goals, overcoming COVID-19, finding a path to a prosperous, uh, socially just uh, and environmentally sustainable world. Uh, this book will really help you and governments around the world uh, to find that trajectory. So Mariana, let me thank you very much. Thank Congratulate you, you for a, a wonderful a book and wonderful leadership. Thanks to uh, everybody that's been joining from all over the world. Uh, and uh, we will see you uh, next time on Book Club. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. And can we save the questions? I'm so curious because I see there's lots. There's not There will be lots and lots of questions <laughs> and they will be they Send will be coming, <laughs> they will be coming your way. And also we have uh, in okay. our book club, we have occasions to uh, uh, join with the participants for live interactions. Uh, and uh, we could look forward to doing that uh, on many of these questions in the future. So Thank you, uh, don't, don't give up. The questions uh, will be read. Uh, and uh, I think we'll have an opportunity to discuss them going forward. So let me thank everybody. And especially, again, thank Professor Mariana Mazzucatu, Mission Economy, wonderful book. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.